Good afternoon and welcome to the Mark Logic uh, community event for October. I'm so glad that uh, so many of you registered to, to, to join. It's, uh, it's an ever growing community and uh, so pleased to see uh, the number of pre registrations. So thank you very much for, for, for joining us today. Um, we've already got a library of content in our community that we've, um, we've been launched since May. Um, we've had customers, we've had partners, we've had industry experts. Um, as well as Mark Logic's own internal experts, um, giving you everything from um, uh, taxonomy uh, insights to uh, training with Mark Logic to AI um, and more. Uh, so we're, we're really pleased with the, the results so far. Um, so please continue to, to join. If you want to check out any of this content, um, there's some QR codes here that will take you to the on-demand videos. Um, if you uh, want to subscribe to our Mark Logic YouTube channel, we upload these normally a day or so after the event, so you'll get notified by that as well. Um, and uh, it's a great way to find other content that comes out from, from us uh, in other parts of the business. Um, we put this out every month. You know, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from your real world implementations of Mark Logic, the stories, the challenges, the successes you have. Um, you know, how long do you want these sessions to last? What's the content you'd like to cover? Um, and is there anybody in particular that you'd love to for us to feature? Is there somebody that, uh, that, that you find quite inspiring that you'd like us to reach out to to, to present on this? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, any, any ideas that you have um, to facilitate that? Um, I'll come on to that in a minute. But uh, our speakers today Sorry, uh, Saritha Kurikos uh, from Nova Nordisk. She's going to take us through fair data, the road to adopting it, um, what needs uh, what needs to make it successful, um, as well as data management in general. Uh, Jim Morris um, is from our sister uh, organization within Progress, uh, Progress Semaphore. Uh, Jim will take us through the Semaphore platform, how it fits in with Mark Logic, um, and how it supports fair data practices. He's going to show you some use cases and demos. Um, and the role that Semaphore plays in metadata and data management. So, um, like I said, to facilitate some of the um, the ideas or questions you might have, we've just launched the Mark Logic Community Portal. Um, on here, it's just a new way to interact with Mark Logic. Um, there are there's prizes, there's uh, rewards for engaging with us. But here, you're going to find the latest news, events, product updates. Um, there's, a, there's a customer forum, so you can talk to us and each other. Um, you can ask questions of the community, um, of the Mark Logic experts we have internally. Um, it's an easy access to all the documentation, the downloads, as well as external repositories. Um, and it's open to everyone. Uh, create a progress ID to contribute, and you can start sharing your ideas today. Um, this is just an example of, uh, of, of what that looks like, but you can see there you've got some of the latest releases, uh, events and things that come up. Um, so please, please, please do register for this. Um, there's going to be more coming on this uh, over the next year. So uh, we're re really proud of what we've done so far and we'd love to, to, to see more people on there. Just quickly, I'm going to cover off a couple of releases. James Kerr is going to give you um, an update straight after our speakers today on uh, the Mark Logic uh, Server 11.1.0 release. Um, but we've had a number of different releases. We've had a Python client API. Uh, new Data Hub Framework 6.0 has been released. Um, there's many others. These are all on the community portal. Um, so feel free to, to, to go along and find all the documentation um, and the relevant information that, uh, that that's there if you want to test or deploy these new new tools. So, without further ado, I will hand you over to Saritha, um, who will give you an update on um, uh, what Fair Data is and how that is working there. Saritha, thank you, Philip. Um, just let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can, yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I basically don't know who's online, so I'm speaking to myself right now. Uh, but uh, thank you for inviting me to this community. And I thought, you know, um, I'll talk about my experience working in Nordisk and what we are doing to make data fair. 
Um, as Philip said, my name is Sarita. I lead a team for data representation in research and early development in Novo Nordisk. And we've been around in this area for about four years now. Uh, that's about the time that No Nordisk intentionally started going digital and they started investing in digital heavily. So we are pretty much new to the digital journey in terms of fair data, but we know that's where we need to go with the machine learning and the progress that's happening in AI. And that's why there's a commitment from leadership to every uh, member of Novo Nordisk in ensuring that our data is fair so that, you know, we are competitive for tomorrow. Um, when we talk about machine learning and everything that happens, I think most people sometimes forget about the value of data that is required for it. And I, I really love this slide because I think people keep telling us that, you know, we can buy data if we don't have data. But the simplest fact is NOAA is celebrating its 100th year and we are a proud diabetes-based company. We were a diabetes-based company. We have expanded into other areas. But I think the wealth of information that exists within NOAA is unparalleled. And if we don't tap into that, I think we are missing out on it. And that's where me and my team come in to make sure that, you know, all the data that's being created within the company and what we can get from anywhere else is actually usable, is actually put to use. Um, let's see. So today I will be talking about what the vision for fair data in research is and what's our strategy. I'll sort of end with uh, what the challenges are to where we want to go and what we think the future is. You know, basically, I'm putting my wish list out there. Um, I, I, I do use this slide in all of my presentations when I talk about fair at source, because if you look at many industry and, you know, across pharma or any other industry, there are two aspects to how you can make data fair. One is you actually get the people who are generating the data to capture the data in whatever format you want. And then after the fact, you harmonize it, you annotate it and make data fair. So that's one methodology. But the other one, which is much more efficient and to the point is actually at source. There's also this term called born fair, that is the data is born fair. So the people who are actually generating the data, they have the best knowledge of the context. And if you ensure that they capture the context, then you're not assuming later on what it meant. That is the vision we are going with. We want data to be born fair right at source when it's being generated. But that actually we also know that it's going to be a humongous change, both in terms of, you know, changing our infrastructure, changing our culture, changing the way we work. There's a humongous change that has to happen, but we already have data. So it's going to be a mix of us setting up ourselves to be fair at scale and at source, but at the same time, also ensuring that what we already have informs us of how we set things up. Um, Usually when you do research and generate data, it's done to prove or disprove a hypothesis. So the data is single use. You do your experiment, you prove or disprove your hypothesis and it's done. But the value of data is beyond that. It becomes much more usable when you start using it to reanalyze and make new decisions, aggregate it and start looking at much more information than what you thought. And this is where FAIR principles come in. If you really want to be able to find data that was generated five years ago for a compound, and then you want to aggregate it with something else, it needs to be interoperable. It needs to be reusable. You need to have all those built in over there so that you can actually use data. On this continuum, if you ask different companies uh, or different uh, industries, you would be anywhere from right at the bottom to the top based on who you ask and which part of the industry, so which part of the value chain they are in, right? Right now, in our journey, we are in a place where we are saying, let's start integrating data. Let's ensure interoperability so that we have huge data sets. Um, for me, there are four equations that sort of summarize what it needs to be fair at source and what it needs to, sorry, why you need to be fair at source and what it means to be that. 
First thing is, if we are telling we want to be on the um, forefront of innovation with AI and, you know, start discovering new drugs, new modalities, everything, use AI to generate this, you can only do that if you have three ways of data, which is, you know, the volume, the variety, and the veracity. So for me, volume is a function of being able to find different data, being able to merge them together because they are interoperable, and being able to reuse that data to make new decisions. That's that's where volume comes. Variety is for me the function of culture and infrastructure. I will explain all of these in a little bit. And veracity is a function of data governance. Accessibility is part of data governance, but I wanted to put it out there, considering especially because if you have human data, they are subject to different types of geographical and privacy laws. So that's why I called out accessibility separately out over here. Let's talk about volume, right? The first equation part, which is the volume, veracity, variety, I think all of you all will agree, or I'll assume you agree with me. But here, let's talk about what volume means and how you can generate the volume. Of course, there are high throughput experiments. You can do these big experiments. But imagine being able to consolidate and merge data from across years. Imagine the volume that comes over there. If you look at the FAIR principles, the F, the I, and the R, if you distill it down, what comes over there is rich metadata with persistent identifiers. And that's what we've been doing in Novo when we started our FAIR journey for research. Uh, and please be aware, I'm talking about the early part of the pipeline, that's research. I don't cover the development part of it, which is a completely different data management challenge because it's subjected to regulatory laws. So I'm talking completely about research. So when we started our fair journey in research, what we decided is let's get the basics right. So on that continuum, let's start by being able to just bring together different data, being able to integrate data to see, gain new insights. You know, we were not aiming big, we were starting small. So we said, let's actually try that. And that's where we started simply with a common control vocabulary. If we can make our rich metadata speak the same language, which ensures interoperability, that was a win for us. And that's where we started. We established a single source of truth in terms of our vocabulary management so that all the systems downstream can have one point of access to all the different types of uh, vocabulary that's needed. So imagine there's a department working with targets, there's some, some other department downstream working on synthesizing the pharmaceutical ingredient. You could have all these departments irrespective of what their core function is, when they register their experiment and they, when they describe something, they use the same terminology and, you know, they're, we are able to in, um, make data integrable. We are able to make data as interoperable. And that's why we established a single source of truth. Now, now that we've done that, uh, I actually was trying to look into what I'm going to talk today. I came across these two hype cycles from 22 and 20, uh, 2020. What I saw was that it's very interesting to see how fast data annotation and metadata moved in the hype cycle to the stage of enlightenment. People keep, you know, everywhere you go, every conference you go, ML, AI are the big things. Yes, they are big, but how much of investment, how much of effort goes into metadata management? How much of effort goes into actually educating people about need for data management and governance? That's always a pain point for people who work in data management because that's never spoken about. And that's where people now, have, we are at a stage where everyone's sort of realizing that if you don't have good data, Everything else is just, you know, systems that are going to exist, opportunities, missed opportunities. And that's where we realized now to tap into the blue sky opportunities that we have in terms of knowledge mining and, you know, using all the data we have, we need to get our foundation right. So we need to focus on the semantic layer. We're building it step by step. We started with control vocabulary. You know, we are expanding into the realm of ontologies. And where we are going with this is, talking about what does it mean when I take biological knowledge, 
that's very commonly known. People know what the body parts are. People know what diseases are associated with what organs, what causes diseases to a large extent. So you have that knowledge. Now, if we can actually merge that with all the knowledge that we've generated over the years within the company with different compounds, proteins, everything. And that's what we're trying to build over here. And we're taking step by step. We finished our part of building the models for vocabulary management. Now we are slowly moving into the realm of knowledge graphs. And that's where we want to go. So the next part is the variety. So when I speak about variety, there are two components to this. That's the culture and the infrastructure. I'm going to speak about culture on this slide, right? So culture is when, when you actually look at data in a company, all you see is it's not fair compliant. The data is not fair. It's not reusable. But that's the tip of the iceberg because underneath lie all the issues. It could be because you know, you really not thought about telling the people who are generating the data what it means. Often only positive results are captured because people think that is what you need to prove your experiment. You need to prove your hypothesis and take it to the next step. No one thinks negative results have value. And that's just culture again. But you need both positive and negative results to actually build a really good model. And that is what we need to go back and change the culture over there. You also need to, now there is a difference between the data producer and the consumer. And this is one of the biggest challenges in industry, unlike in academia, because we go to all these fair conversations and you know talks where people say in academia or in institutes, how they institute fair principles. And it's, it's quite difficult in industry because the people who generate the data may sit at a different site than the people who actually consume the data. And you know, they're completely different. Now we have been trying to say that every research project that you do should have data science as an integral component. So right from the planning of the experiment, involve the data scientist so that you know that the data being generated, you can use it to prove or disprove your hypothesis, but at the same time, it's of quality to be used for the next machine learning models, the next analytics, whatever. So the data scientist is involved right up front. So you're bridging the gap between the producer and the consumer. Then making things fair, when you're bringing this cultural change, there's going to be a dip in productivity. It takes time, it takes effort, and that's not going to happen overnight. So leadership needs to acknowledge that this is a process it's going to take time and at the same time also incentivize people so if technicians are sort of um uh, assessed on their performance of how many screenings have they done or how many assays they have done we also have to accommodate that the numbers are going to go down when you change your system when you're asking them to capture more metadata because it's a learning process there is going to be a dip so we need to actually incentivize that and understand there is going to be a dip, but you know, that's part of the change process. Um, usually fair data is also sort of marketed as needed for machine learning. Well, that's true. A lot of scientists actually relate to being more than machine learning. They relate to the fact that this data helps your next big innovation become a drug or become a product. And that's what is more relatable to bench scientists than telling it's a machine learning use case. So, you know, the narrative has to change to what's in it for the scientists when they're taking this effort to make data fair. That's the culture part. And then the infrastructure part, obviously. So if you look at infrastructure that exists, and this is a pet peeve of mine, we have some systems that are really, really good in Novanodisk. But some of the challenges are the metadata is free text, right? Um, I can write a lot of free text, but all of us are humans and we decide what is important from our perspective, not necessarily always think about what is important in the future or later on. And that's where if you actually pre-model metadata that's required for defining the experiment and ensure that nothing is missed, 
then you're making sure that you're not leaving it to the scientist or the person creating the data to figure out what's important. That's why it needs to be fair infrastructure. But at the same time, remember, there is a challenge over here because research is synonymous with innovation. You're not doing the same things again and again. You're doing completely different things. The simplest example is the blockbuster product of Novo Nordisk right now. If you go and look at it in our records some time back, it did not have the same name. The name came 10 years after we worked on it. So we need to know that our system, while being fair compliant, should also be flexible enough to allow for innovation. And this is what we've been working on right now. How do we respond immediately to the needs of the users when they say, I have this great new compound that I designed. I need you to register it, create a name for it, bring it into the vocabulary. How fast can the turnaround time be? So these are the things, some of the things that we are working on when we talk about fair compliant infrastructure. The last part is veracity, and that's a function of data governance. And like I said, I highlighted accessibility to ensure that our human data is compliant with the geographical laws and the consent policies that exist. I think a lot of you all sitting on this call know about why governance is important. I hope I'm preaching to the choir. So I'm not going into details, but this is the last part of it, because if your data does not have the quality, it is equivalent to LLMs hallucinating because you give bad data, you're going to get bad results. So if you want to ensure that your models are performing best, you need to give it the best data that's possible. So. What are the other challenges we've had along the way? And it's simple. It's very simple because I've done a lot of things along my career. If you look at my LinkedIn profile, I've played at a lot of different roles in this data science journey. And I made a decision that data management is where I want to be. But in the four years that I built my team, I can honestly tell you I've heard all these things that are written on the slide, starting from, oh, you've done a great job. This is the most important thing you could do. But I want to do an AI model. Can you refer me to your colleague? Or, yep, yeah, nope, data management is not for me because I cannot grow in this area. And the simplest thing, sometimes data management is not considered scientific. And it, it's a very, very sad fact, but this is how it is. So finding people who are committed to data management to build a team, it is a really tough challenge, and I've, I've faced that over the past four years, so I can reiterate that a hundred times. It's not an easy place to be. It's also difficult because perseverance and persistence is what's most needed in this job. Remember, cultural change is an important aspect. That means you have to keep telling your scientists why this is important. I told you that no, and many other companies like us have a long history of success. People have been doing successful things for a long time. If it was a failure, it was easy to bring about change. But when they have been doing successful things and you're trying to change, you need to have really strong reasons and you need to persevere over here. Finally, to wrap up this, if I were to say what's my wish list, I would really like for us to be able to partner with academia because it goes back to what I said in the last slide. How many students do you find, how many new students do you find who come educated in data management? Uh, how many courses are out there that talks about a doctorate in data management? Not many. I, I, I've really not seen that many out there. It's also we would like to set up some industry standards about how to implement FAIR at scale, because you know all of us can go in a different direction. I told in the beginning, you can actually do FAIR at source or later on, and different industry prefers different things. And we are trying and figuring out how to do this. But if we can have a community around how we can speak about this and set up some guidelines how to achieve this, I think that'd be really great. Another common process is when we set up these um, big instruments which generate our high throughput data. Every instrument we have buy has a different data format, has a different vocabulary, and it's all over the place. And just bringing them to a standard data format. Forget 
interoperability of vocabulary just to bring them to a standard data format is not an easy thing right now um well i can't tell make data management great again because it was never great people always considered it as you know something that needs to be done and someone else will do it or actually say my wish is that if you could make data management relevant as relevant and as important as people talk about machine learning and ai I think I'd be very happy about that. With that, I think I end my talk over here and I can take if there are any questions for me. Um, Saritha, thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping Jun's uh, can uh, enlighten some of the issues that you've kind of highlighted there with um, with what we do with uh, Semaphore. Um, we have had um, uh, a question come in. Um, Will the slide deck be available afterwards? Um, uh, I'm sure there's many people that uh, are fascinated by some of the stuff that you shared there. Um, so if we can, we will share a copy of this, um, uh, Saritha, if, if, if that's all right with you, uh, via our community forum. So it will be available there um, uh, shortly after uh, this presentation. But um, uh, if you have any more questions for Sarita, if you have anything that sort of pops up as you're listening to uh, Jim's presentation or the rest of the presentations, then please feel free to ask. Um, Sarita is going to leave us at the half hour, but um, I'll make sure to connect people or answer questions um, and get those uh, answers to you uh, as soon as possible. But once again, Sarita, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it's really great to see. Um, so now I'm going to introduce uh, Jim Morris. So Jim Morris is an information scientist and solutions architect. He has a dual role uh, within within the organization um, and uh, works, uh, like I say, with what I would call the sister technology to Mark Logic. Um, it really is a part of the family now um, and, and a key part of uh, building a modern data platform. So I'm going to hand you over to Jim. Jim, you can uh, share your screen and uh, away you go. All right. Thanks, Phil. And thank you, Sarita. Uh, you know, I've, I'd seen that presentation uh, before, uh, the recording that, that Sarita did uh, at a conference. Uh, and uh, again, I'm just uh, blown away by her expertise and, uh, and insights into uh, the FAIR data practices and how they apply to life sciences. Um, uh, we're uh, uh, we're fortunate to have her part of our community. So uh, just to confirm, my screen is showing. Correct. It's always good to confirm. Correct, Jim. No problem at all. <laughs> all right. So I have a. Uh, while Sarita was talking, I I, uh, I tend to do this. I thought of well, I have some other slides that might be speak right off of what she was talking about and. Uh, so I'll try to use this as quickly as possible. I know I'm under a time limit here, but and so I'm going to show a little bit of background. My background is in is mostly in uh, pharmaceutical uh, R and D. I spent uh, many, uh, many years uh, there as an informatician or uh, as part of the information science team, and dealt with a lot of different areas, uh, stemming from uh, the, the the drug discovery uh, support. Uh, that Sarita was specifically focusing on all the way to enterprise content management, enterprise vocabularies, enterprise taxonomy, just, which is how I got connected up to Semaphore and, and started working uh, working here about nine years ago. And I, and I But since then, I've worked with plenty of other life sciences clients. We, of course, have uh, uh, several uh, pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical uh, clients that I work with. Uh, so I've been able to take uh, learn a lot more about what's going on in other other parts of the business, parts of the company, other types of companies. So Sarita was very focused on the early uh, early process of drug discovery, but but very, you know, the, the the point was that it's about managing the data, the idea of, of the fair data practices at the source. So get the data encoded uh, and and captured and and record it in a way so it can be reusable. And I wanted to, this is a slide I've, I've uh, used a long time ago, and I'm gonna do it very quickly, I promise. <laughs> that if you look at the overall uh, drug development process, and this is, a, this is all very simplified, 
you know, uh, anybody that's part of any one of these development cycle parts of this, of this process would be have concern about it. But this is for spent tended to be very high level. Because what, what ultimately does a pharmaceutical company create? Is it a pill? Is that what gets approved, the pill or, or the injection? No, it's, it's actually the documentation for all of the research that went into it. Documentation uh, uh, and, and that supports the data that went into this. That's what the FDA and other regulatory uh, 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 bodies approve. And the, so the, and the, the, that summary, even get it with your pills, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, a, you know, an, an insert into your pills or what your doctor gives you. It's, that is, is tracing back to this entire pipeline from e early research to preclinical, clinical development where, you, where it goes into human uh, studies and ultimately to launch. So that's, it, it just stresses the, 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 the volume and complexity of information that is represented in a very succinct form. And any place you, you represent that information on the back of a box, uh, in a flyer, um, in information distributed to doctors, it's all regulated, number one, so it has to be correct. And if it's not correct, you need to be able to respond to those uh, challenges immediately, which means you have to be able to go back to wherever that data came from in this pipeline. So let's take one example that you would think might be simple, the name of a drug. How, how hard can that be? Well, even just the name of a drug is a very complex uh, uh, information management challenge. Because if throughout this pipeline, you're going to start with just chemical or biological identifiers. They might just have a, a, a scientific name uh, going to uh, where it's actually, OK, we have something we're going to study. Let's make it a research code. Then it goes in the man. You get a, a, a generic name or a non-proprietary name. And then ultimately, it gets uh, labeled with a brand. So the pro and there's others in here, too. But the process by which this happens and this transition. So if, I'm, if I get an FDA warning about Motrin, for example, I need to be able to understand all these names in order to connect this data. Now, these labels, these are labels, you know, what you call things. They represent things. They represent concepts is what we call them in the semaphore world. And, you know, we're talking about drug concepts, drug products, brands. These are all very different concepts. And to stress how different they are, consider what they relate to. So what defines a drug product? Well, it's not just the name of the drug. It's everything that's related to it. And this is a small sample of all the possible um, related uh, concepts. And so you need to understand all of this. And all of these have labels. They all have many labels, not just, uh, not just these represented here. And there's so many others. And each of these, each of these things, uh, related concepts relate to a dozen, you know, hundreds more. It's a very sophisticated network of, of concepts. And that's why uh, this idea of fair data practices has taken off so much in, in the pharma space. Um, I don't know if uh, Sarita put something like this up there, but just as a recap of what fair is, uh, it speaks to being findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Sarita talked about each one of these. And, um, and it is very much taken up in the research area I, I have this slide up here because there's there are other uh, standards that later in the pipeline uh, that are very important as well is the information attributable who, like who's responsible for it and and it has to be correct it has to be this data has to be completely accurate of course it has, to be fair data it should be accurate too but the the, the stressing this is what the regulatory authorities are looking for. Uh, you know whether you can reuse it to make another drug or not is not of interest. They're they're interested in uh, can I depend on this information? So when you look at overall at pharmaceutical biopharmaceutical companies, they need to look at both of these perspectives. And what does it all come down to? I'll skip over that. It comes down to metadata. It comes down to this. You don't have to call it metadata. It comes down to valuable data. It comes down to data that is well described. So, and what do we mean by that? How do you describe data? Well, some of it just comes with it. You know, when was it created? Creator is probably pretty simple. 
Uh, then you get into semantic data where you, you're tagging it to, to those particular concepts like we saw before. What, what product is this actually about? Uh, what, in what market in terms of geography, things like that. But then you get where, where this descriptive data, metadata gets even more valuable, you get into the active and augmented metadata or active data, active metadata. And that's where data is more fluid, you know, where you can actually, I can be in marketing and do a query of other data, you know, data for earlier in the pipeline and still be able to find it because I'm able to match my perspective with the data as it was created and 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 described by the creator as as Sarita was was um, suggesting. And can that data change? I mean, there there's you there's different uses for data. You you may need to go back into that data and reanalyze it, retag it, redescribe it to meet a new need. You're trying to develop a drug for a different purpose and you need to understand what studies need to be done. You need to go back there and maybe do some additional analysis, tag it again. So your data needs to be fluid. Uh, uh, regulations change. So uh, information that may not have been um, needed to be retained before needs to be retained in the future. So it gets very uh, complex. So I'm mentioning all this. I'm here to talk about Semaphore. is because Semaphore supports these later rich aspects of, of, of metadata. And you know that's why we call Semaphore a, a semantic AI is one of the ways we described it, is where it has to be very intelligent and it has to be driven by the meaning of things and just, and as important, the, how things are represented in data, uh, which is more about labeling and, um, uh, and, and naming things. So if you're gonna, find concepts in data, you need to know how they're expressed. So it's, a, it's not just about the things, which sometimes the semantics, people think it's just about the, what things mean, but it's also what they're called. And that's why semaphore is very important. That's why taxonomies are important, ontologies are important, um, and the ability to apply those things. So um, the last introduction slide I have here is just about this is from another presentation I did, but I, I, it, it matched so well with what Sarita was presenting, I had to bring it up here, where when I uh, look across our uh, half dozen or so life sciences, pharma, specifically pharmaceutical clients, I'm not talking about healthcare and our, all, all those other uh, life sciences related clients, but they, it's, 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 and this is how, what's, all these things map up to what Semaphore strives to be as a product. It intends to be uh, part of the right infrastructure. So we specifically mentioned that you need a tool that fits with your architecture. It needs to be easily integrated full with your systems. Uh, it has to support multiple perspectives. It has to be able to, uh, it has to be easy to use. And that's an important part of this. If you expect people to tag their content at the source, and to take that extra, you know, non-scientific activity on, uh, then they, it has to be simple. It it has to be it has to be correct, but it has to be simple. So um, so all these things go into what some what makes Semaphore what it is. Uh, what I what I always like to say is try to make it easy for people to do the right thing. The right thing is to make your data fair. If you're accountable for the information you create in a company like this. So make it easy for people to be accountable for the information that they have. I'm gonna skip over this. We can come back to generative AI, you know, sorry to mention that, so it's worth mentioning. When we talk about that, why is metadata so important? Well, when you're asking these questions of a generative AI system, and I'm, you know, think specifically of an external one, like a, like a, like ChatGPT, something like that, that's, that's general purpose. You need to provide it with, proprietary information, private information to support the queries. And you can do this in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, um, risk uh, sharing the wrong information with, with the outside world. But, th and that's the key. You, have, you need to know what you can support your queries with so that when somebody, so that the generative AI system has information that it can use, not store forever, but use to answer your questions. And that's how you uh, limit the hallucinations, and you make have these uh, these you leverage these external 
so, uh, uh, large language models for your benefit. There's, we've uh, progress as many um, has been doing a lot of webinars on this topic uh, with my, uh, my with my colleague uh, Imran. So take a look at those. Okay, let's talk about Semaphore. Um, Semaphore is a platform. It has uh, different components, and they all work together. So let's just walk through describing those, and then I'll get into actually showing how it works with Mark Logic, and what, and then we'll look at a couple examples. The heart of Semaphore is managing semantic models, knowledge models, which covers things like vocabularies, taxonomies, ontologies. Uh, lists, uh, synonym rings, you know, an anything that, that covers defining what, a, what, a, what, what something is and, and what it's called and what else it relates to. This is the heart, and it's important to remember this, that everything you can do with Semaphore is intended to be controlled through this model. And these, this, is a, this is a model, it's, we get very high marks for the usability and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, represent how we represent this very complex activity in our in this model management component, uh, and that's what because we're trying to make it easy for subject matter experts, not programmers, uh, to enable very sophisticated types of metadata and uses of that metadata. So let's talk about those uses because Semaphore is not just about managing the models; uh, it's about making those models useful and putting them to work in fair data practices, really. So one of the most important ways we make use of it is by what we call classifying uh, data. And it's really about enriching data, uh, extracting data, harmonizing data. It's looking at any any type of data, but really textual data. So, you know, but, but I, we try not to say documents because obviously documents are a key part of the of the challenges of managing information well. But even a, uh, as I think Sarita mentions, even a full text field uh, with one word in it, or 10 words, or a paragraph, is semantically a challenge. It has to be defined, like what is this paragraph describing? Is it, is it, is it something we need to know about? Uh, what product is it really mentioning, regardless of what it's referred to as? So all, e even down to just small bits of text to 800 page you know, clinical reports, these are all uh, uh, this is all information that needs da needs data needs metadata needs descriptive data to help uh, find it. It also they also contain data. Uh, you know sometimes the data that you're looking for is in a document, uh, and that's a real challenge in in uh, research organizations like this. Is to is that a lot of the data you know uh, is is stored, approved, made official. You know, a lab notebook gets a stamp. I don't know if it gets a stamp, but it gets approved. This documents our research, and often it's a it's a page that has data in context. You need to be able to get into that data and extract the data out of it in a way that's understandable, in a way that's um, you can uh, uh, you can support. When being challenged, how do you know? How do I know we, that that's the data? Well, because we we defined our rules to look at information in a way that we can uh, uh, tell you exactly how that metadata was created. Semaphore is very much about supporting that type of practice. The other part of man of using these models is really about making them available. So we've talked a lot about this. You need to you need to be able to manage your models in a way that they can be easily brought into other systems. It doesn't do anybody much good if you've got your taxonomies in some very sophisticated uh, ontology system, and you've got a scientist over here trying to do correct, fair data practices, and they have to go over to this uh, ontology system and and find out what you know what part of this very sophisticated thing should be related to my data, uh, even if you're trying to build a system to do this automatically. You, Semaphore takes these very sophisticated models and, is, and through this third component, these all represent components, through this third component is able to make these, this information easily consumable uh, downstream. All right, that's the components in a conceptual way. 
in a uh, architecture way. We can look at it this way just really quickly. Uh, progress semaphore here is here at the top. There's our three components, model management in the center, uh, a distribution of the models through our integration services and our classification service. It's all driven by the models. And then we integrate with really anything. Again, we're trying to be part of the infrastructure. So we need to be able to integrate with any system you have, whether it's a SharePoint you know, or a, a open, open text or Oracle document management system, uh, whether it's a enterprise search system, uh, which you know, everybody has at least several of, right? Or you're trying to just create data for use for analytics in, in, in maybe a metadata hub or a data fabric or something like that. So we, our, our APIs, uh, some of which designed to work with the other things. It manages models, but it needs to integrate with things to really realize its full value. So that's why we focus on our APIs and our integration capabilities so much, so well. But remember, you guys are all MarkLogic uh, experts, right? MarkLogic is all of these things and more. This is what makes Semaphore and MarkLogic such a powerful combination. And why many of our life sciences clients uh, uh, have both and have had both for, for many years uh, because they work so well together. Here's an example of a MarkLogic integration. And there's many ways to, both MarkLogic and Semaphore are designed to be very flexible in terms of how they connect to other data sources. So there's many ways to do this, but you could think of Semaphore integrating with MarkLogic like this, where you've got uh, a corpus of data either inside of MarkLogic or coming into MarkLogic. You've got to um, handle that somehow with something like uh, a, a very an open source type of solution like NiFi or something else. And if the data is annotated, by Semaphore, so we get that rich data, that additional metadata that describes things, goes into MarkLogic, and that makes it more consumable here on the left-hand side with the user making requests of the data. And it can use these ontology lookup services that Semaphore provides uh, to, to facilitate that query. And you know, you'll have these slides uh, to be able to look at this more closely. Um, and I'm sure you can imagine many other ways that we could be integrating uh, together. Uh, in most cases, if Semaphore is working with MarkLogic, the MarkLogic triple store is actually the back end, uh, the actual database that Semaphore uses. Uh, we don't have to use MarkLogic, but it's certainly better if, if we do, uh, because there's a lot more power uh, on that platform. Semaphore is used in many different ways. Uh, I'm just going to go through, I'm just going to show these on the screen because you can read these later. But I have these separate out in, in a, this kind of go across our biopharmaceutical clients, ontology management, liver, literature surveillance, compliance, regulatory, across the pipeline. We have uh, working in early research all the way up to regulatory, uh, regulatory and marketing systems and manufacturing systems uh, in uh, pharmaceuticals. A couple more use cases that go even beyond our, uh, uh, this particular industry that I thought would be um, compelling. Uh, in terms of search, analytics, e-commerce, some really cool uh, examples of how Semaphore is used to support uh, e-commerce systems, which of course pharmaceutical companies have as well. Okay, let's look at Semaphore quickly. Let's see where I am here. So consider if we go back to um, this is this is semaphore again we're, it's 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 corresponding to our three major components and this is what you use to manage semaphore so I'm not showing examples of an end user system uh, that that's connected to semaphore I'm showing you semaphore which includes it's how we develop the strategies and so forth to do what semaphore does I'm going to go into the modeling component and take a look around. Semaphore can manage many models. Uh, some of our clients have hundreds of models uh, 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 being used. It's, it's a, a lot of capabilities in here. Um, I'll just stress that it's very easy on the eye. <laughs> 
Uh, but the, underneath all these little buttons, there's, there's a, many capabilities for managing this information very effectively and, and securely. Um, so you can see I have a few models that I've selected here specifically with pharmaceuticals. Some of these you may recognize if you're in pharmaceuticals, the NCISSRs, the Human Disease Ontology, or DOID, uh, MEDRA for regulatory activities. So I have a few of these specifically um, loaded in here. And if we uh, you know, look at one of these, let's look at the NCISSRs. That's a, that's a very large uh, thesaurus from uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, here in the U.S. Um, and it's from the National Cancer Institute specifically, but it's a, but it's a very um, rich uh, multi-purpose vocabulary that a lot of people use. The This is all workflow. We want to go into that, but in terms of having multiple users look at this data from multiple ways so they can add their perspective to it. You know, I'm reusing a public vocabulary, which every pharma wants to do. They want to, there's lots of vocabularies out there to reuse, but you need to make them specific to your um, to your challenges. So let's just pick any term here and take a look at it in Semaphore, uh, just to give you an idea of how uh, rich our environment is. So I'm in a taxonomy of diseases, looking specifically at, at sarcoma. Uh, you can see that it has a lot of different labels, you know, very important diseases and labels, um, a lot of metadata about them, a lot of cross references to other systems, all these different uh, uh, specific ways to describe it, what they're relating, all the concepts that it relates to. If you remember my first slide, uh, we can look at this visually as well. Uh, so you can see the sarcoma is, uh, is corresponds to all these other related uh, concepts. Um, and we can navigate the model that way. Uh, you can see how, how sophisticated and, uh, and rich the, uh, the, uh, the NCI thesaurus is. So let me show you uh, another way to use these models. Let's go back to the, the top of semaphore and um, and look at a couple what we call integration widgets. So these these will show us quickly uh, how, how what ways that you can interact with the models. Again, I stress the importance of of Semaphore being able to um, distribute these models effectively. So if you, even if you just want somebody to to find uh, a concept quickly, uh, this is one of the services. Just you could put this in your search engine. Many people do that, or it could be in a lookup. Uh, call from a database so people can immediately look for the terms that might be relevant to them. Uh, and there's many other, there's a couple other services if you want to show you know the tree uh, view of the entire vocabulary or you wanted to um, you know search on it in, in some other way. Um, so in terms of you know putting a natural language screen uh, query and having it find related concepts from one model or multiple models. Uh, you can control exactly how the service gets distributed and how it's built. Um, and again, these are things you can put into your user experiences, search engines, uh, BI tools, uh, any type of front end. That's the integration part of Semaphore in terms of integrating the models themselves with downstream systems. It's so important to Cerise's positioning on FAIR data, and Semaphore supports it completely. The other part, very sophisticated part of Semaphore is classification. I'm going to show that very, again, I'm going to show it quickly because I'm running out of time. This is this is a test interface. I'm, again, I'm not looking at an end user experience. I'm looking at the test interface for Semaphore as I, so I can completely understand how Semaphore uh, works with data. So I'm going to give it uh, a piece of data uh, really quickly. And let's say it's a you know the data is very common in, in pharmaceuticals. This is a, a patient adverse event report. So if a, a, if a doctor sees a patient having an adverse event, they need to provide documentation for that, and that goes into a very complex process within pharmaceuticals to uh, uh, um, to 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 respond to regulatory authorities and, and adjust the research and do whatever they need to do. Um, so on the right, I have my document. So this patient came in that uh, had this indication and so forth. And I want to show 
I'm, I'm classifying this data against uh, the MEDRA vocabulary, which is another uh, medical vocabulary focused on uh, clinical findings. Um, and so you can see I've, I've already identified many uh, concepts that are mentioned in here. Some of them are, are uh, easy to identify just by their main label. Uh, but others are, uh, you know, are slightly different. We're tagging this with the official term of coronary artery disease, but the evidence we're seeing lit up on the right, on the left-hand side, is a different term. So we're able to, to do that pretty easily. The other thing, you know, MEDRA is a hierarchy. And if we see lots of terms in a certain category, we're going to tag the category. So this is uh, something very uh, of great interest to people to be able to say, uh, I'm looking for every every indication that is in some category of a um, uh, you know of a coronary artery disorder. So the coronary order, uh, artery disorder it doesn't appear anywhere in this document, but we're able to find that data. Very simple example. These rules can be very sophisticated in terms of if you see this and this, but not this, then then tag it this way. We can develop very sophisticated metadata. The other example. I wanted to highlight here is uh, is these are these groups up here. So suppose we're looking for a little more detail. Here I've, I've, I'm trying to tag what this document is about or what concepts does it contain. What if I want to extract the data that's actually uh, in, uh, explicit in the text? So here I have other set of rules here that's saying, well, is a patient mentioned? Yes, a patient's mentioned, and a patient, and we've pulled out the year of the patient and the sex of the patient in this case. Uh, we've also found um, drug uh, names. We found that Lunesta is in here for the treatment of insomnia. So we're pulling out two different concepts that we know, but we know about Lunesta, we know about insomnia, but we're finding the relationship between them in the context of being a treatment. We're pulling them out as a specific fact. This is all metadata. That's what we do. We create metadata. This is all metadata that then gets added to your system into Mark Logic or a content management system or something so that it can be found again and, and, or, and used as data in some downstream process. Uh, we're, you know, we don't only have AMP, Lunesta, we also have Ambien used for a, uh, uh, a different purpose. They're both sleep uh, drugs, but they're being used for different purposes here. That's very important, that's a sign. <laughs> Those are things that, uh, that uh, clinical scientists look for uh, in data. Uh, to be able to uh, make some decisions about, well, what, what is what, you know, is this an off label use or, or something like that? What drugs is it being taken with? Uh, and for what purpose? That is a whirlwind -whirl tour of Semaphore. I hope you appreciate the, um, the context I gave to it at the beginning, because I, that's extremely important to me as someone who works with these clients. Uh, to understand their challenges and and to help uh, communicate about semaphore and help semaphore uh, remain relevant uh, to these clients with extremely sophisticated uh, information uh, information needs. And I'd be happy to go into any more detail with anybody at any time about our um, uh, uh, about our product. So thank you. I'll send it back to uh, Phil. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, uh, really interesting to see um, it becoming more and more apparent that uh, tools like Semaphore the, the, and that metadata management, um, as well as metadata discovery, um, is becoming more and more important, not just in the, the life sciences one, but we're also working with publishers, we're working with um, auto manufactured companies, um, to, to, to leverage this metadata. So, um, yeah, really interesting. And thanks very much, Jim. Um, we're running slightly over. So if you have to leave us, don't worry, this will be recorded. Uh, but we'll, we, we've got another update um, from the Mark Logic side of the business now. Um, and that is James Kerr. Uh, James, it is over to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's presentation mode here. All right. See my slides okay? Perfect, no problem. Okay, great. So yeah, I'm, I just uh, uh, so wanted to jump in here real quick and give a quick update on the latest release of MarkLogic Server that was done earlier in the month of October here. 
Um, this is Mark Logic Server 11.1. Uh, this is <clears throat> our latest minor release of Mark Logic 11, which came out at the end of last year. Um, so I'm just going to go through this real quick, real whirlwind uh, overview of basically what we have uh, published in our release notes and uh, on the website about the new features, et cetera. So I'm just going to go through them real quickly and, and you know, answer any, any questions. So um, yeah, so in MarkLogic 11.1 added uh, a new feature called Optic Update, and that's in tech. Uh, technical preview, and uh, that uh, we're continuing to develop that feature. Um, that that feature allows you to use the Optic API, which is our multi-model uh, query and now uh, update API uh, in language that allows you to um, declaratively create expressions that you know tell the database what. Uh, what documents you want to have updated, right? So the initial release of that uh, supported JavaScript on the server side, 11.1 uh, adds xQuery support. So you can uh, use the Optic API to create uh, a pipeline of expressions to say, select a certain, you know, select documents that match uh, a CTS query. And then uh, in this example here, we're calling remove. So this is what like a, a delete expression would look like. But you can um, do a bunch of different uh, operations against documents. You can um, you know, remove them. You can um, update them, you know, change, uh, change the fields, uh, and then save them. Or you can insert new documents via that API as well. Uh, version uh, 3.0. 1.0 of the Node.js client API also added support for the optic update uh, operations. Uh, one uh, really great new feature in 11.1 in is support for reverse proxies. So, uh, you know, Mar with MarkLogic, you've always been able to run it behind a reverse proxy or load balancer, but accessing the, the UIs has been. Um, has been problematic um, because MarkLogic wants you to, you know, access the different user interfaces on the different on the like the specific ports that they're running on, right? So the admin UI has to be on port 8001, Q console on 8000, etc. So we um, have added support for path-based routing for accessing all of the MarkLogic uh, server UIs. <clears throat> um, so you know, you know, in your load balancer, you could configure you know, uh, listening only on uh, port 443 for HTTPS, for example, and route the slash admin UI to the MarkLogic backend 8001 or Q console to port 8000. Um, and uh, there's a number of HTTP adders that are uh, required uh, to configure within your load balancer or reverse proxy to make this all work correctly. Um, and the client libraries, uh, you know, Java, Node.js, and, and also MLCP, um, and the XCC client libraries uh, were updated to add a base path uh, connection option so that, yeah, you can connect to, say, uh, a specific port, uh, but use that base path to route to the specific app server that you want to access. One note on this is that because of the way digest authentication uh, works and uh, certificate-based authentication, um, those are not supported through the reverse proxy or um, load balancer. So you have to use you know, one of the other supported uh, authentication mechanisms uh, when accessing MarkLogic through MarkLogic UIs uh, through the reverse proxy or load balancer with path-based path routing. So on the UI side, um, you know, in MarkLogic 11, we added the, um, we updated the look and feel of the admin UI. We added a, a, a common header that goes across all the apps with a, with a marker that uh, allows, allows you to indicate what environment you're in. Um, but 
we also heard from people that they needed uh, really a full width uh, banner that goes across the top. So that's added in 11.1. .1. So you can fully control the, the style and the look of that banner that goes all, all the way across the top of the screen rather than, or in addition to um, the marker that goes in the, the UI header. Um, we fixed a number of bugs in the uh, query console, some annoying ones with control A not working correctly and copying and pasting, and uh, some other bugs fixed in the admin UI. Uh, another new feature that I'm excited about, and this is improving you know, the observability uh, of the server, is forest memory diagnostics. So there's a new, some new options in, t in XDMP forest status that allow you to um, uh, list out the su a summary of all of the sizes of the memory map files, as well as request a detailed list of uh, a per index memory usage um, of, uh, of all the memory, sorry, all of the indexes that are configured within the database. So, this gives you a lot uh, of information about yeah each each range index or lexicon and how how much memory that individual index uh, is is consuming. Um, and one nice thing about that is that you know it, it tells you um, like if if the memory has not is not consuming any memory, then you are likely not using that index. Um, and that's a common question from customers is, you know, which range indexes am I using, which ones I'm not. So this new, these new diagnostics uh, should help answer those questions. Um, some uh, supporting features to do the, or supporting functions rather to do the mapping between index IDs and the actual um, database configuration. And this information is also available in the REST endpoint. Um, security enhancements. Um, a uh, new feature, we added audit auditing for the public key infrastructure and the key management system uh, subsystems. So there's two new uh, audit events that you can enable, the PKI user uh, audit event, which uh, audits when any public API operation occurs that's related to the whole PKI um, or KMS uh, subsystem. And then PKI system, which is a really, really low level audit with basically any sort of PKI or KMS operation that happens uh, can be audited. Um, the, to go along with this, the audit logs are now controllable um, separately from the error and access logs and the request logs. So uh, in the past, if you turned on encryption for those logs, um, it was either all or nothing for audit or, or all of those logs, but now you can control the encryption independently. So you could turn on encryption for just your audit logs, but leave the other ones um, in plain text. Platform updates, a bunch of new changes uh, on the platform side. Uh, one note on MLCP, because we upgraded a bunch of third-party libraries to fix uh, some vulnerabilities, uh, we <clears throat> that requires us to now uh, only support JRE uh, 11 or later with MLCP. All the clients still support uh, 1.8, um, but uh, MLCP uh, requires JRE 11 or later now. Uh, AWS CloudFormation templates, we um, made a couple of great improvements there, supporting the IMDSV2 uh, a metadata <clears throat> API, so that's the you know latest uh, secure or more secure uh, metadata access mechanism from AWS. Uh, launch configurations, which are, are more uh, flexible mechanism for um, uh, for controlling how your uh, how your instances get created uh, as you scale up your um, your uh, the hosts within a cluster. <clears throat> um, then, and so launch configurations replace the, the previous launch templates. 
support for S3 buckets with object lock, lock and compliance retention activated, right? So this is specific, specific setting in S3 buckets um, that wasn't supported before, that is now. Um, the MarkLogic automatic cache sizing uh, prior to 11.1, uh, that only worked up to uh, 256 gigs of RAM for automatic cache sizing. And now it supports up to 512 gigs of RAM. So if you have more than 512 gigs of RAM, you still have to configure your, um, uh, your caches manually uh, to get the, the ratios that you desire. Um, and support for other uh, Red Hat 8, 7 and 8 distros, Rocky Linux, Alma Linux, Oracle Linux. Uh, this is all predicated on their guarantee of one-to-one -one compatibility with uh, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But uh, we, we've updated our support matrix uh, for those. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the extent of it. Really fast run through. And you know, for more details, you'll visit the uh, visit the, the release notes and the new features list uh, on our documentation website, as well as the bug track support portal that gives you the full list of all the bugs that were uh, fixed in 11.1. Great, cheers, James. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's a lot of improvements there. The good to see a lot of usability improvements and. Um, uh, and, and making it easier to use the, the, the platform, um, as well as those other new exciting tools that are coming in there, like the Optic API. Um, we did have one question. I'm not going to do a full Q&A today, because I think we're, we're running over quite a bit, but I just want to get some announcements out. So just have one question, though, for you, James, which was, if you would delete an entire collection using op colon remove, would the load be distributed across the cluster automatically? Yeah, cur currently no. The Optic API is um, uh, is still a, a transactional request based mechanism. So if you say op remove on one e node, um, it's going to process that uh, that request for all of those within a single um, within a single transaction, right? So you still, uh, as it currently stands, uh, you still have to you know orchestrate deletion or operations. Uh, against large sets of documents, if uh, you know, spanning across yeah. multiple transactions, but that's something that we're um, looking at for future consideration. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and if you have got any more questions or feedback of what you'd like to see in the product in the future, um, whether it be one particular aspect or overall, um, then please do reach out via the community forum via csm marklogic at uh, progress.com. Um, we'll get that feedback and we'll make sure it's shared with um, James's team uh, and engineering as well. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen quickly, just go through a couple of quick announcements um, and then uh, then we will bring it to a close. So thank you very much, James. Um, next month at the community event, um, based on your feedback, we're going to be doing a geospatial um, event. Um, that's going to be featuring our long term charity partner, Sensing Clues. Um, and the work that they do using um, geospatial um, data for a variety of different use cases from anti-poaching um, uh, exercises to wildfire um, monitoring and things like that. Um, and then Clever Llamas is going to give us uh, a good all-round sort of update on um, uh, geospatial there. Um, and again, we'll probably have another product update. Uh, so it'll be another full pack session. Um, that's going to be the last one of the year. But um, what we did have a couple of weeks ago um, is the uh, Bright Talk Summit. Um, and this was a follow up to our popular LLM and private data event. Uh, why semantic knowledge is so important for trustworthy enterprise AI. Really well attended. But if you didn't have a chance to make it, um, please do check it out. I also wanted to highlight uh, another webinar coming up, which is uh, leveraging generative AI to jumpstart your semantic knowledge modeling. So if you found what you've seen with 7.4 today really interesting and you're looking at generative AI, or even if you just want to see more of the platform, I'd recommend checking out the dedicated 7.4 session. Um, and that's on the 16th of November at 4 p.m. GMT, 11 a.m. Uh, EDT. So, um, yeah, please do check that out. I'm sure it will be a very interesting session. Um, as I said, this is the last session of, uh, of, of the, the, the year next month. 
uh, going to take a holiday break. But for 2024, um, we want to know what you want to see. Um, you decide the content that, that that comes up in your community thing. As of today was a, a request from the community to get this in. Um, so let us know. Visit the community forum. Email us at csm-marklogic.com. Um, really do. Um, we really do appreciate your ideas, um, and we like to 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 see if we can get speakers and and things like that to to join us for those days. So um, please do give us your feedback. Um, it's really welcome. Uh, questions. So if you have any questions from today, because we're not doing a Q and A, um, please do let me know. Um, ask them in the the thing there. Leave them on the feedback, um, or put them in the community forum. We will get to them. Uh, there was a question around presentations. I'm going to speak to all the presenters afterwards, see if I can get you a version of the presentations that you've seen today uh, up on the community forum um, so you can have a look at those. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers today. Thank you, um, Saritha, James and uh, Jim um, for, for, for your efforts. Um, and uh, yeah, really enjoyed today and uh, I hope to see you again next month. Thank you very much.